Hi, I'm Wes Long, President of Index Fund Advisors. Welcome to IFA, where we replace speculation with an education. Today, we are honored to have in our studio Eduardo Repetto, the Chief Investment Officer for Advantis Investors. In addition to his duties as Chief Investment Officer, Eduardo directs the research and implementation of Advantis's investment strategies. He oversees their investment team, their marketing initiative, and works with clients. Prior to Avantis, Eduardo was the co-CEO, co-chief investment officer, and director at Dimensional Fund Advisors. Dr. Repetto earned his PhD uh, in aeronautics from California Institute of Technology. He has a master's of science degree in engineering from Brown University, and his undergraduate degree in civil engineering from Universidad de Buenos Aires. He's also a trustee of the California Institute of Technology. Eduardo, welcome. Thank you, Wes. It's always a pleasure visiting you and visiting IFA. You know, we know for such a long time. It's always a, a great very to come here. Yeah, yes, yeah, indeed. Yeah. So uh, tell me, um, a PhD in aeronautics, a master's of science in engineering, and you're doing investing. And yeah, well, uh, how does that happen? <laughs> things happen in life. You know, you never know what, but things happen in life. Uh, before going to grad school, after my undergrad, I, I work a little bit with a, with a mathematician. So a PhD mm -hmm. in mathematics from Caltech, uh, Luis Reina, a uh, just bright guy, amazing, ama amazing guy. And he was the, the head of differential equations in the IBM Research Center in Upstate New York, in Jordan Heights. And he, he, I learned a lot from him. And at some point, he switched from, you know, differential equation, that is some weird math, let's call it, you know, and switched to Wall Street. And he did it because the tools that he knew, the technical tools that he knew could be applied to other problems, not only the scientific problems that he was trying to solve for IBM. Okay. And, and he said, look, this is quite a lot of fun. When you do a career in science, you learn, you, you develop a lot of knowledge about different set of tools. Mm -hmm. And those tools can be applied to science, but also can be applied to other topics like financial science, that's science, or marketing, or other, any other field that you can imagine. And so that inspired me. So when I finished my PhD at Caltech, uh, I have to make a decision. The decision is, do I continue in academia becoming a professor? Or do I do something else? And something else could be, uh, you know, working in engineering field or researching in, in any kind of uh, company outside academia, or doing something completely different. And I said, let's try finance. And and it's quite common to have people from technical backgrounds to move uh, to financial sciences and investments. It, we we are lucky to develop as I mentioned before, a, a process to learn things, a process to advance science, and that can be applied to investments. And, and that's how it happened. I, professorship, no, I, I, professors, you know, being professor in university is a prestigious thing and a great thing, but it wasn't really for me. I, I really wanted to work in something different. My projects in academia were very long-term projects, research projects that you could you could spend years or decades uh, without seeing the outcome. In some cases, you never want to see the, the outcome because it's weapons, you know, that you really don't want to see how they work. If you imagine what weapons I'm, I'm speaking about. Yeah. Uh, I really wanted to work something that you can see the effect of your work in people's life and try to see how how you are contributing for the well-being of people. And I think you can you, you can do medicine, but no, that's not for me. That's, you know, I cannot deal with blood and all these things. To, I, I can't. So, but finance is a, a place where you can apply your knowledge, your hard work, in order to try to improve people's life and you see the effects in, in your lifetime. Well, and, and based on the leadership that you've demonstrated in financial services and, and the number of clients ultimately that have benefited from that leadership, I, I think you probably chose the correct path. So, thank you, Wes. Thank you. So, Avantis. Tell us about Avantis. Who, who is Avantis? Well, Avant Avantis Investors is, is a unit of a large company called American Century. So we created Avantis Investment Investors like uh, three and a half years ago with the goal of bringing 
cutting edge financial science, very good investment structures that we will speak in a minute, like ETF, not only just mutual funds ETF, uh, that have some advantages, and also a very attractive fees to the market. Why? Because if I have a cutting edge investment strategy in, a, in very tax efficient vehicles and with low fees, any investors are better off. My goal is to help you as and advisors in general deliver better solutions for their clients. Because if you are able to deliver better solutions for your clients, they are better off and all of us become happy. Our success depends on having this end client have a better outcome. And so we have to worry about all the different components that come into facilitating that better outcome. So when you say attractive fees, you, you mean low fees for the client, not attractive fees to Wall Street, right? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> low fees, low fees. And you know, we came with fees that we are just shocking to the industry because basically we shake everyone up uh, saying, look, these guys in advantage are coming with fees that are way lower than other fees that are out there. And uh, for value-added products was just basically a breakthrough in, in, for, for advisors and for end clients. And so we were able to deliver something that uh, it certainly adds value to the end client. And if I can help you help your clients, your clients are happy, you're happy, we're happy. Yes, indeed. So in addition to low fees, t tell us about the investment philosophy advantage. How do you implement that philosophy? That, that's a great question. So, so First, we, we care about trying to have well-diversified portfolios. But we care about having well-diversified portfolios that can have higher spectral returns. Mm -hmm. You can imagine that in the market there are tons of securities. Not all the securities have the same spectral returns. Some securities in the markets are priced with a price that is a little bit higher than others related to the fundamentals. So the securities have a higher price related to the fundamentals they have low spectral returns, and the security of the price happen to be very attractive. And in order to identify which securities are priced in the market with attractive pricing, you need to use financial science. So what we do is we use cutting edge financial science to understand what securities are priced in the market with a big discount rate. So the market is, the price in the market is a price that is attractive, is low relative to the uh, fundamentals of the company, the cash flows, the equity, the balance sheet of the company. If you are able to identify those companies better, yeah, mm -hmm. you are able to create better portfolios for your clients. And your clients will have better expected outcomes. And you can do that in a diversified way, just to try to minimize uncertainty and risk. Uh, there is no need to take risk beyond the risk that I inherited in the business of investing in equities and, and fixed income. So what we do is just deliver portfolios that can be used in a seamless way in broad asset allocations so the advisor can deliver value added, minimize risk, and have all that at very attractive fees. And on top of that, with extreme tax efficiency. We're going to get to the tax efficiency part here in a, in a minute, I think. But what you just described, I think, is commonly referred to as, as value stocks or value investing. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. That if, if that's, that's a very good question. So value investing is trying to buy, like you go to a restaurant. You go to a restaurant and you say, oh, look at the restaurant that I went the other day. It was magnificent. I, have, I didn't pay too much. Well, that was value for you. So value investing means that you're buying securities that have some attractiveness to you. The attractiveness in general is on the spectral returns. So, but the definition of value changes across people and changes about across time because, you know, 20 years ago we knew less than what we know today and in the future we'll know more than what we know today. So if you go, if you, the conventional definition of value that people use is low price securities. I have a low price security, so since the price is low, that must be a, a value buy, something attractive to buy. So I should buy all the one dollar stocks? No, yeah, that's where I'm going. That's the definition, traditional definition. And you see that traditional definition across index funds, across managers. But a more cutting edge definition is not just focusing on low price securities. A more okay. cutting edge definition is trying to find companies that the market is pricing at a big discount. 
So remember that I told you, not every security in the market has the same expected returns. Some securities have higher than other expected returns because the market is pricing those securities with a big discount. Think about the cash flows that the company is expected to get in the future. So the cash flows are based on the, prices of the, the pricing of the company. But if you have a big, big discount, those cash flows are heavily discounted when the market is coming to that price. Yeah? Right. And so mm -hmm. the new, better definition of value is not low price security. It's having security that the market is pricing a big discount because a big discount is high expect returns. I always think about this. We brag when we go to restaurants and we find a good restaurant and we tell our friends, hey, I went to eat this sushi, it was amazing. But you don't brag if you go to a restaurant and the price is low. The price has to be low, but the service good, the food good. Because if it's just about low price, you will buy sushi in a gas station. I say, oh, you're not going to brag about that. <laughs> so you brag when you have all the good qualities and also good price. This is the same. What you want is companies at the market is pricing at big discount. This in, in, in spite of having good fundamentals. So the price is low because the market is discounted those companies' prices heavily. And do academics influence or inform your investment strategies at Avantis? Absolutely. You, you, you really have to think about financial science back in everything that you do. So the way we think about that is, you know, many people just rely on empirical data. And empirical data is you go to look at things that happened in the past and find that certain securities do better than others. The problem with just relying on empirical data is things may happen in the past, but you don't have any expectation of them happening in the future. So we do a little bit more than empirical data. What we want is to have a theoretical framework why this should persist in the future. I see. And the theoretical framework that we use is valuations. At the end of the day, you know, Valuations matter. It matters when the Babylonians were trending donkeys, you know, 3,000 years ago. And it will matter when in the future, if we live in Mars and we are trading water on oxygen, it will be the same. It's valuation. So how much you pay for a service, how much you pay for a cash flow, how much you pay for the balance sheet of a company. And so a theoretical framework based on valuations is what informs us on expectations going forward, but the theoretical framework needs to be backed by empirical data, because if not, the theory doesn't fit reality. And so what we, what we demand in the strategy that we have is a theoretical framework that is well recognized and is backed by financial science, and then empirical data that says the theoretical framework is realistic, fits reality and it should work going forward. So when you have that, you feel comfortable about your strategies and that's what we pursue all the time. So let's talk a, a, a second about small stocks versus large stocks. There, there might be a perception out in the marketplace by investors that you want to buy large, well-known companies, always. Is that? So it, it is, this is a great question. Not, we were speaking about not all the companies having the same expected returns, and this is true. So it doesn't matter if the company is large caps or small caps. You probably want a little bit of all of them. But when you're thinking about the expectations of our performance, expectation of high expected returns, you have way more small cap companies than large cap companies. Some of these small cap companies are not so widely followed than the large cap companies. So when you're looking at price of the company and discount rates of embedded in that price, the market is coming to a price based on the discount rate that, is, uh, that can be inferred from that price. If you're looking at the dispersion of valuations that you see in the small caps, the small caps, uh, you can find much higher expected returns that you can find in large caps. And this right. is, for example, if you look at the value stocks in small caps, you can find that value stocks in small caps have, have had in the past, and, that is, and based on valuations are expected to have, much higher expected returns than stocks in large caps that are trading at a very high price relative to the company produced in, in cash flows or the balance sheet of the company. So, Small caps gives the opportunity 
of the liver higher spectrum returns and enhancing the overall performance of the asset allocation that you are putting for your clients. Ah, a, a, a key word that you just mentioned, asset allocation. Asset because allocation. Based on what you just said, why wouldn't everybody go out and just buy a portfolio full of small cap value stocks and, and, and be done with it? That, and, and I'm not telling you that there will not be one person that that's the right portfolio, but for most of us humans, that's not going to be the right portfolio. So there, there, is, there was a breakthrough uh, research, and this is, is, you have here in IFA the, the drawing the, the, of uh, Harry Markowitz. Yes. And, and so what, what's the breakthrough that Markowitz have? So this idea of portfolio asset allocation didn't exist. I'm going speaking about long time back, 70 years ago. The idea of asset allocation didn't exist. The idea of portfolio didn't exist. The idea that existed at the time is the idea of spectral returns, just spectral returns. So if you want to maximize the spectral return, and I tell you the spectral return of all these 10 securities, if you want, the only goal is maximize the spectral returns, you're going to buy one security, the one that has the highest spectral return. But Harry Markowitz discovered, hey, that doesn't seem to be the right thing because you have to trade off you have to balance the spectral returns and the risk that you take, exactly. the diversification yep. that you want to have in the portfolio. Yep. So there is a trade-off between how much you want to push to get the spectral returns and the diversification that you want in the portfolio. So if you just want higher spectral returns and you don't care about diversification, yeah, you may buy one name, one small cap company with high profitability and very low price relative to the equity. Yeah? And you just buy that one. But that's not really probably the right portfolio because it's too much risk. It's more of flipping of a coin. It's a little bit on the speculation based on education. So if you look at the concept from Harry Markowitz, they say, no, you have to balance that spectrum that you're searching with the diversification that you need in the portfolio. And that's the concept of portfolio started to take place. What is called risk return trade-off, if you want. And then the asset allocation is just creating a good portfolio that delivers diversification and also enhances performance. Yeah, you're right. I think for, for literally decades uh, before Markowitz, people didn't think about the correlation between risk and return. If you want more return, there's got to be, by definition, more risk involved in that return. And your example of one stock might work well until March of 2009 rolls around and, and you're down 80 or 90 percent and then what? Then you get scared and you sell and, and, and you basically have lost everything that you invested. That's why diversification, I think, makes more sense for the, the average investor. And, Would you and, agree? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And it's even more simple than that if you want to think. You say, when we're estimating spectral returns of companies, so we, I told you this security has the highest spectral return. Well, you can imagine that there is estimation error there. How can you do the exact spectral return and know that the, that one is higher than the second one? Yeah. So you have estimation error in everything that you do. How tall is my son? Well, I have one that is around 6'3", <laughs> but it may be 6'4 or 6'2". I haven't seen him for a couple of months because he's in UC Santa Barbara. So I don't know. There is an estimation error in all that. The moment that you recognize that there is estimation error, the more important diversification is. And so, and when you put together portfolios for your clients, you're thinking about the estimation error, you're thinking about the risk tolerance that your client has, you're thinking about the need to risk for higher spectral returns. And that's a beauty that an investor can speak with people like you, Wes, that have the knowledge to understand what they need and how to put together portfolios for their future. Yeah, in our opinion, it's vitally important to, to match someone's capacity to handle risk with their exposure to that risk. And, yeah. and we spend a fair amount of time educating investors on why that's important and helping them to get to that correct allocation of risk in, in their portfolio. But let's shift gears here for a second. We, we talked a little bit earlier about tax benefits to uh, Avantis. And, in my mind, that brings up exchange-traded funds, or commonly known as ETFs. Yeah. Give us your definition of an ETF and, and explain, if you would, why is it that ETFs are considered more tax efficient than an open-end mutual fund? Yeah, that, 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 that's a great question. Um, 
if, if we look at cash flows in the market, the, the market is, in, is based on a lot of informed people and advisors that inform investors. And you see cash flows into mutual funds, money is flow, flying out of mutual funds, so investors are leaving mutual funds and moving to ETF. So if you just look into the market, the market is telling us who is the winner and who is the losing. But, but let's explain why is that the case. So both the ETF and the mutual fund are what they call commingled vehicles. So many, many investors benefit from investing together in, in an ETF and also in a mutual fund. So it's not a vehicle, it's not an investment for just one person like a separate account will be. It's an investment for many people that get together at the same time. Okay. So if you have a mutual fund, someone goes and tries to purchase mutual fund shares what that someone does is send cash to the mutual fund. And if I'm the portfolio manager of a mutual fund, I see that you are sending cash. I find cash in my custody account, and I have to use that cash to buy securities. Who pays for the cost of buying securities? Every investor. You give me the money, every investor pays investing your money. Yeah? Yes. If you take your money out, yeah, I have to send you cash. But in order to send you cash, I have to have cash sitting in my mutual fund because it's not that I can sell securities and send you cash. If I sell securities, it's some, the securities when you sell securities in the market, you don't get the cash immediately. You get to two days later. So if you are redeeming from the mutual fund, I have to have cash in the mutual fund to be able to wire you the money. And then I have to sell securities to replenish my cash, yeah? And if I don't have enough cash, I have to borrow money to send you the, your, the cash that you need. So who pays for selling the securities and the line of credit and all that? You don't pay because you are already out. All the other shareholders that stay there are paying for all that. And it's more, when I sold securities to send you the cash, I may be realizing capital gains. And who gets the capital gains realization? Not you, because you're out. All the other shareholders get the 1099 at the end of the year saying, you owe taxes because Wes uh, took money out. So you're realizing capital gains, and everyone's so paying by you. <laughs> well, we don't, we, don't, we don't say Wes, but if they knew, they will blame you. So when you have an ETF, all that is gone. So ETF doesn't deal for cash. It's not that when you buy an ETF in the market, I, as a por portfolio manager of the ETF, I get cash. I don't get cash. When you buy an ETF in the market, the broker, the market maker that sold you ETF, in order to get the ETF share, they have to give me securities. What securities? The securities that I happen to want to create a, to, to create a better portfolio. So I have a list of securities that I accept. It's called the creation basket. It's I have a set of securities that I accept to issue an ETF share that I will give to the market maker, and then the market maker will give it to you. So who pays for that transaction? The long-term shareholders don't pay, because I don't, I don't receive cash and I buy securities. I directly receive the securities. So the long-term shareholders are very well protected. You pay your way in what is fair, and then the long-term shareholders eh, don't have to pay for that cost. And in the way I out, is exactly the same. You sell an ETF share in the market, yeah? the market maker buys from you. Now, the market maker wants their cash, yeah, because he's going to give you cash. In order to get the cash, they will call me and say, Eduardo, I want to get rid of these ETF shares. What do we do? We give them securities. What security? The security that we don't want in the ETF anymore. We give it to them. They sell them in the market and give you your cash. And that's an income redemption process. You can notice that I, I didn't have to carry cash as in a mutual fund because I'm not wearing you cash. I didn't need to sell securities because I deliver securities in kind. So I didn't incur in cost of selling the securities. And even more, since I didn't sell securities, I, don't, I didn't realize capital gains. 
So the long-term shareholders in ETF, at the end of the year, for that income transaction process, will not get a 1099. So the structure is a more modern structure that really has a lot of advantages. That's why the market has decided to use them, that structure. A couple of, of comments on that. One, in an ETF, if securities have dividends, they'll still get passed through Absol to the investors. I, I want to make sure we don't leave the wrong impression no, absolutely. with, with um, investors that, that that does get passed through. They work ex that works exactly the same as in a mutual fund and an ETF. In, in both, in a mutual fund and ETF, if a security, let's say Apple, pays a dividend, that dividend has to be distributed at the end of the year, uh, to, or, or in a quarterly basis, whatever the frequency is, to the, the shareholder. Yeah. And, and then on the capital gain side, just, just to clarify, uh, because th th this topic can get complicated to some folks, uh, I own shares of the ETF, and liquidations out of the ETF happen, and you already explained that those securities get sent out. As a result of that, all that, that truly happens for me as the owner of the ETF is I have my original cost basis, and uh, if the ETF has done its job over time, at the point that I decide to sell, I will incur a capital gain at that time based on my original cost basis, but I won't get any of the capital gains distributions from other, as you said, investors in the fund that might liquidate prior to my decision to get out. That, 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 that accurate? That's absolutely accurate. And, and look at this year. For example, this year, uh, you know, pitifully, we have this year is a down market. So we have seen, uh, we don't know how it's going to end. Hopefully it's going to go up dramatically. We don't know. But right. we know that from uh, the end of last year to now, market has been going down. And so what can happen? If a lot of people redeem money from a mutual fund, they can finish with a capital gains tax bill at the end of the year and negative performance. What is something that really people don't want? So the ETF provides a lot of protections. It's not, it's, it's, it's on expectations. You have a lot of protections that, that will minimize the tax bill if not completely uh, eliminate the 1099 with the capital gains line item. But that, you know, not every ETF is done the same way, and so you have to be a little bit careful. That was going to be you my You have to be question. a little bit careful, and that's why uh, I think that advisors provide a great service, because, look, my mom is not going to analyze every ETF structure and say, this is an ETF that will provide tax advantages and good benefits on the spectral returns and whatnot. Uh, why? Because... My man has other business, not investment. No, she's, he was a teacher. No, if I need to fix the roof of my house, yeah, man, if I try to do it, it's probably not going to work very well because my experience <laughs> doing that is probably not the well, best. You're an engineer. You would know how to do it, right? <laughs> Even if I'm an engineer, it's probably not going to be very well. You hire someone that has expertise. So I think when you are analyzing ETF or asset allocation and everything like that, you know, that's where people like, like you guys come and say, look, we analyzed that, we did the due diligence, and this, these are the ones that can provide advantage to you, Mr. Investor. So one part about your explanation, maybe you could give me a, a little more clarity. So you, you described in an open-end fund how the cash comes in, you have to go and buy the securities, and there's transaction costs involved with that. At some point in the ETF process, securities have to be purchased. Who bears the cost? of those transactions. That, that, that's that's a beautiful. So think about the ETF. Everyone bears the cost of the transaction. So you come in, everyone pays for your transaction. You go out, everyone pays. No. If you go out, you don't pay. Everyone else pays because you're already out. So, so you said ETF. You mean in the open-end mutual in fund? In the open-end mutual okay. fund. In okay. the open-end mutual mm -hmm. fund. In the just a mutual fund. Most of them are open-end investment companies. So the, the 40 Act applies to both, but okay. in, in a mutual fund, when you buy, you become a shareholder of the mutual fund, you send cash, the cash has to be used to buy securities, right. who pays for the cost of buying all the securities? Everyone. Correct. Yes. When you redeem, yeah, you want your cash, you redeem, you're already out. Right. 
So I have to sell securities who pays for that everyone but you, because you're already out. Yes. And who gets a capital gains realization from selling those securities? Well, everyone but you, because you're already out. So at the end of the year, someone will get 1099. In the DTF, when you come in, you go and buy an ETF share in the market. That ETF yes. share in the market will have some spread between bid and us. The cost of buying, the price for buying, and the cost for selling, is not going to be the same. There will be a little big gap that is called the spread. Yes. So in an ETF, the person coming in pays a little bit more than the person going out. And that spread is the cost of basically delivering the securities to the ETF or accepting the securities in the way out. So who pays? The person paying, in general, is the person coming in and out. What is it really, really more fair? Now, some, some, something that is extremely interesting is that you know, every security in the market, you go to Apple, you go to Microsoft, you go to Berkshire Hathaway, all of them have this bid as a spread. The, cost, the price for buying is different from the price of selling, if you are going to buy or sell a security. So if you look at the average bid as a spread of the, sec the, the securities inside an ETF, that average bid as a spread of the securities inside the ETF, in general, in the vast majority of cases, is much wider than the bid as a spread of the ETF. Okay. And, and there, there is a lot of academic work about that, but it, it comes from the risk that market makers are facing, some of that, and, and why. Imagine you're a market maker, and I tell you, hey, Wes, I'm going to sell you a million shares of this security. One name, a million shares to you. Immediately, you will say, hmm, I don't know if Eduardo has information that no one else has, and I, I have to protect <laughs> myself. So when you are trading and making markets in one name, you have to price with wider spreads because sure, you have the risk of having asymmetric information, someone that knows more than you, giving you something that then is going to do not as well and you lose money. When the market makers create markets on ETF, they don't. The baskets is not one name. It's hundreds of names. So if it's hundreds of names, the risk that risk of someone knowing more than you is gone. It's completely minimized. Because if I have information, it's on one name, maybe two names, having information across everything. So that, that cost is gone. So that's why they can price it more, uh, more attractively. So it sounds like what you just said, going back to Markowitz, is the correlation between risk and reward applies across many different fields or many different areas of investing. Because what? the market maker is, if he's going to take more risk, he or she is going to want more reward. So the spread widens. To be fair, right? applies everywhere. If you have think, if, imagine that you are an insurance company and you're going to sell me car insurance and you're going to sell to someone that is way more uh, co cautious than me, uh, car insurance. Or my son, when I have to get, I have three sons, uh, you know, one's 20, one is 18, they are 115. When they came to start driving, yeah, the cost of insurance to, <laughs> to insure them was very different, the cost of insurance to, to insure someone that is uh, my age. With, you know, when I, th I don't think I'd have a, a, a driving ticket for more than 20 years, I don't remember when. Uh, and so, uh, so that's insurance cost, sure. and it's pricing the risk relative to the benefits that they need to have as a company to survive and, and create value for the shareholders, employees, exactly. and whatnot. So yeah, this applies everywhere. Yeah. Okay, good, good. You'd mentioned earlier that markets have been down this year. We're in a more difficult market than we've been in in the last several years. And we have all this talk about recession on the horizon with your background in financial services and investing, give us your sense of, boy, there's a recession coming. Shouldn't people just sell their portfolio and sit on the sidelines, wait for it to get better? Yeah, look, uh, that, that's, that's a great question to me. And, and, and it's a question that affects all of us because investing is about being able to deal with uncertainty. 
And if everything was certain, there would not be returns. Yeah? The returns would be trivial. What, but so what are, you just said is we need uncertainty to get returns as investors. That, you, need, you need some level of uncertainty to have returns. Because if someone is telling you, for sure, tomorrow you're making a dollar, the price of that contract, for sure, tomorrow you get a dollar, the price of that contract today is probably a dollar or 99.9 .9 cents. Because it's for sure. So what you want is... You may get a dollar tomorrow on expectations, so suddenly you are not going to pay close to the dollar. You're saying, well, I'm going to pay you 50 cents because I don't even know. So you're going to lower that price enough until uh, it's a good deal for you. And that's what the market is doing. So if you think about, uh, you say, we may get entering a recession. We may already be in a recession. We, for, that, for that, we just don't know. If you look at the first and second quarter of this year, there was negative yeah. GP, G, GDP growth. Uh, so uh, we may be. And, and, and how you define recession depends on different people define in different ways. But the market probably is already pricing a recession that, that we may be in or we may be in. So when the market prices go down, it's because the market is saying, Uncertainty is coming. Like the insurance company, when my kids start driving, they start charging more. Well, exactly the same. Here, uh, the market is seeing a, a possibility of recession or recession. The market prices go down and down and down. Why? Because the market is rewarding, demanding high rewards to face that risk. So if you look at the performance of the market during recessionary periods, the market performance is negative. If you look at from the beginning of the recession to the end of the recession, the average monthly performance of the market during those periods is negative. Immediately say, let's, let's get out of the market. Why wouldn't wait, you? Wait, wait <laughs> a second. If you get the recessionary periods and look at the very beginning of the recessionary periods, so let's say the first half of the recessionary period, the performance of that first half is extremely negative. The second half of the recessionary period, the performance is very, very positive. Great performance. So when we are sitting today, after seeing the market going the way it has gone, the market probably priced already. You know, in the price, the market already said, oh, let's go down in prices because the recession is coming. If we leave the market now, we probably miss the second part. And we don't know when the second part is going to be. It may take another six months, it may take longer, it may take shorter. We just don't know. But we know that if we live now and we say we are going to put the money in the bank, we are missing that. And many people seem to be doing that, by the way. You know that if you look at bank deposits, you know how much money is in bank deposits today? $18 trillion is in bank deposits. That's a lot of money. So some people will miss the opportunity because during every recessionary period, pitifully, we see people leaving and not being there uh, for the market coming back. Right. And, and that's why we need to realize that investment, investing is about discipline. Not trying to speculate and say, we're going to in, be in at the right time. Because no one knows the right time. We know the right time after the fact. Yes. And so let's be disciplined, let's invest, and if we look at the performance of the market since we have data in the early 1920s, it has been super positive. You, know? you see growth of the dollar charts and up and up and up. And if we over, over print, so print on top of the growth of the dollar, all the times that the market have gone down 5%, 10%, 20%, we're going to see a, a humongous amount of lines saying, despite the market going up, we see a lot of times that the market, a lot, a lot, is just full of this market going down 5, 10, 20 percent. And I always think about this as driving. Look, I'm here in IFA in Orange County. I live in Los Angeles. I need to go from here to Los Angeles. And you don't know what is driving in the 405 or the 5 freeway. A humongous amount of traffic. And I really don't like traffic. What I'm going to do? not go home because there is traffic, or saying, 
despite the traffic, I'm going to get home. You could take I, a helicopter. <laughs> it's a, what, a risk return, you know. The, the risk is higher, the, the, the price is higher. So, so but, but despite the traffic, we take the journey. Yeah. I get home. And if I think about investment, it's despite the market downturns, I trust the market. I've seen the growth of the market during different periods, long periods of time, and I want that growth. So better if I get accustomed to these downturns because it's part of investing. So, so are you telling me Avantis doesn't have a crystal ball and can tell us when the market downturns are gonna, gonna happen so you can take investors' money out of the market? <laughs> Look, <laughs> here is the crystal ball. No one has that crystal ball. That's, if you could you, predict uh, the future, Yes. It, it will be amazing. Yeah. But if you could predict the future, and everyone else can predict the future, probably we're not going to have higher spectral return. The future will be happening right here, right now, and we yes. don't have the returns. So yes. look, we are, the market is giving us the opportunity to embrace risk, to embrace uncertainty, in order to grow our money, as long as we do it prudently. And we do it with reasonable fees, and we consider taxation, and we do it in a diversified way, and we do it based on financial science supporting what we do, expectations are on our side. And that's the best we can do. And be responsible when the investment, not take risks that we shouldn't take. Know our risk tolerance, because you don't want to discover that you have the wrong to risk tolerance when the market is down. You want to score before and have the right portfolio so even when the market goes down, you can sleep comfortably. Not happy, but comfortably. And so I think that that's the value that you guys have to your clients. I think that goes back to, to, to investors having the proper exposure to risk so that when the volatile times happen, they're not happy because it's volatility. No one's happy with that, but they're able to withstand it to your point, hold on so they can take advantage of when the markets do turn around and go up. And the markets turn around very fast. So remember, I told you, on the second part of the recession, you are not out of the recession yet, but on the second part of the recession, the market recovers very, very fast. And why? Because the market is pricing things in anticipation. You are not out of the recession, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. And that light at the end of the tunnel, the market acts. Yes. and recovers. And by the way, in the second part of, of the recession, volatility is huge. A lot of ups and downs because there is uncertainty, but returns are good. So you can have good returns despite the high volatility. And being disciplined is the only thing that you, you can do. You have been in business like me for a long time. And every time that the market starts recovering, you hear the news, you hear the, the, the pundits, I think they say, saying, there's going to be double dip. It's recovering, but it's a dead recovery, and, and all these things. I said, imagine if people have so much information. It will be amazing. I think I have to do, just tell some story. Be disciplined. And as you say when you started, when you start to say, we are here at IFA to just have education to overcome speculation. Yes. And so if you're investing just based on just random calls, that's probably speculation. If you bring education, discipline, and an investment process, that's investing. The, the process word is, is, is very, um, very good to, to bring up. I, I want to summarize a little bit what I think I heard you say, and that is that markets, prices in markets for securities adjust so that the investor gets the expected return. That, would, that, would you agree with that statement? Absolutely, absolutely. So imagine, this is simple at the end of the day. Imagine that you think that the company that you have is not going to make $10 in earnings, it's going to make $5 in earnings. What do you think that the price of that security will go? It has to go down. Mm -hmm. Because who is going to pay the same that it was going to pay before? Let's suppose that you're in a time of high uncertainty, that you don't know if it's going to be 10, 5, or 15. Yeah? It's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of variability. Yes. Well, you're going to lower the price because of the uncertainty. And so your expected returns are going up when you're lowering the price. And so the market reacts very, very fast. Remember, the market is a combination of a lot of people that are doing free transactions. They're getting into those securities and other securities without any imposition, without any regulation. 
And if they're doing that, they're doing it because they think that it's a good business for them. And so if it's a good business for them, the price will adjust in order to have a reasonable expected returns given the circumstances. And in times of higher uncertainty, that reasonable expected return probably is high. And, and if you look at the data, if, if I'm not mistaken, the monthly expected return of the U.S. market is about 1% a month. Yes. Uh, so if the expected return is 1% a month, would you agree that now is always the best time to invest? <laughs> yeah, 1% a month is a good number no matter what. <laughs> but, you know, if, if we're going to speak in numbers, I'm, I'm always trying not to say numbers because having numbers uh, with, with, without a chart <laughs> is, is difficult. But if you look at the average return of the U.S. market uh, during a recession, it's not 1% a month. It's minus 0.2%, somewhere like that, so negative, minus 0.2%. Now, if you look at the first part of the recession, it's like minus 2% a month. If you look at the second part of the recession, it's plus 2% a month, so tw twice the double of the average. Yeah? yeah. And so what it's telling you is what I told you. The market price, every uncertainty, every recession, very, very fast at the beginning, and when there is light at the end of the tunnel, the market is recovering very fast. Yes. Well, and at IFA, we like to remind investors that you, you go through a volatility period like we've gone through so far this year. Who knows what tomorrow brings? But it's been extremely volatile. And we hear a lot of, oh, the market's selling off. The market's selling off. I like to remind investors, in order to sell, there has to be a buyer. Yes. So every day, trades get settled on the sell and buy side. So for every seller, there's always a buyer. So somebody thinks that they're going to get their expected return going forward, or they wouldn't be buying. Yeah. Look, if, if you remember, um, um, during uh, February and March 2020, when the pandemic was at full swing, uh, yes. and many people uh, suffer, so we're very sad about that, but uh, the market went down a lot. In a very short amount of time. In a very short amount of time, the market went down a lot. And a lot of people left the market. If you look at the week of March 23rd, uh, 2020, so if you remember, that's a week that the market got to the bottom. $365 billion got into mar government money market funds. So people that say, I'm done, out. I cannot deal with this anymore. I'm predicting catastrophe in the future, so I'm out. $365 billion is a lot of money for people just bailing out. Yes. And the sad thing, the market the, for them, the sad thing is yes. they have the opportunity cost. The market recovered, and probably they were not there. And I'm sure that your investors didn't have that experience because you have education and said these things happen. Markets downturn are part of investing. And you have to have the discipline to deal with those market downturns because you hope for the recoveries at the end. And if not, you just lock in the market downturn and you have you don't have the recovery. I, I, this came up, we did our, our quarterly review call here recently with our clients. And I made the point on the call, and I'd like to make it again, that we expect market volatility, and it's a healthy part of how markets operate. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, in my career, I, I get most nervous if we've had a number of years of markets having gone up, because I know at some point they have to correct to stay healthy. They can't go up forever. And I think that's a hard concept sometimes for investors to understand that the volatility and markets having sold off is a good thing for the health of the market. It's not fun to look at your statement and see the values of your investments down, but we have to have that. That's how markets operate. And it's important to understand that. You know, as you're speaking about volatility, and, and, and this probably is a message to all of us, uh, you, me, our families, and, and your viewers, volatility will be high. Volatility, when volatility spikes and goes up, it stays high. And so the, even the market may start recovering, volatility will continue to be high. It takes a long time to volatility to calm down. And why? Think about that. When you get shocked by something, your blood pressure goes up. 
takes a while to come down. Your anxiety goes up, takes a while to go down. Think the same about the market. Yeah. There is uncertainty, and so volatility spikes. News come in and out, and market reacts a lot to news coming in and out, one direction or the other. And so we are going to have a lot of volatility, and it's going to continue. You threw a, a rock in the pond, the rock is already gone, but the waves keep on going for a while, and then at some point they dissipate. But it takes a while. The same, we are going to have volatility. Volatility will stay for us for a while. Well, that's, that's part of why we emphasize education at IFA so that we can keep that blood pressure down. Yep. We understand that it's not fun, again, to see markets that have gone down, but, but it's going to happen. We just it's don't sad. know when, and we don't know for how long, but uh, yeah. the education should help with that. Eduardo, this has been fun. Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming in. And hopefully we can do this again soon. Whenever you want, you know. Right. We, I live close by, despite the traffic, I live close <laughs> by. One hour away. But Wes, thank you very much. And the whole team, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you next time.